I'd like to welcome everyone to our seventh seminar of the year. We have one more after today. I see that we have a great audience and with some very young members. Uh, welcome to all of you. I'm very pleased to introduce Fiona Martin. Fiona is Assistant Professor in the Department of Sociology and Social Anthropology here at Dalhousie University. She's cross-appointed to Gender and Women's Studies. She has a BA from Queen's and a Master's and a PhD from University of Melbourne. She's a sociologist whose research focuses on women's substance abuse and on harm reduction services in Atlantic Canada. So those are general areas of hers, and those topics come together uh, in her specific focus of research right now, which is the politics of drug treatment for pregnant women and mothers. Uh, she's principal investigator on a three-year project, which is on pregnant women's access to and experiences of methadone maintenance treatment in Nova Scotia, and all of this brings her here before us today. Please join me in welcoming Fiona. Hi, everyone, and thank you very much for having me here today. Um, <clears throat> So I'm going to start this talk just by um, giving you a bit of background on some roadblocks that I encountered when I was doing my research. What this talk will focus on is um, the findings of a study that I took out sev took, undertook several years ago on young pregnant women in the process of disengaging from injecting drug use. But what was interesting is that my initial aim wasn't to explore disengagement per se. I actually set out to talk to more what are called socially integrated um, drug users who are actively using, who are also pregnant women and mothers. And not surprisingly, I found it extremely difficult to recruit this population. Um, I learned a couple of important lessons from the outset. One was that I was obviously using a flawed recruitment strategy that didn't adequately anticipate how unwilling active drug users who were also pregnant women and mothers would be to come forward and talk to an outsider, a university researcher, about their experiences. And I also realized how likely it would be for this population to either be engaged in drug treatment or to describe themselves as trying to stop, reduce, or modify their injecting drug use. I draw your attention to these lessons learned because they, they tell us a lot about this topic. And I'd like to take a moment before describing the study and outlining its key findings to give you a bit of background, which will help put, um, put the kinds of circumstances that the women that I was speaking to were um, experiencing into perspective. <clears throat> so first of all, it's important to realize that when we talk about drugs, we're talking about a moral and legal category of substances. We can define drugs in technical terms as substances with psychoactive properties that have an effect on the operation of the central nervous system, but this isn't usually what people mean when they talk about drugs. What people usually talk, mean when they talk about drugs is a category of substances that are remarkable for their legal and moral status. Alcohol, for example, is not commonly considered a drug, neither is caffeine, even though both are psychoactive substances that have an effect on the central nervous system. Fifty years ago, nicotine wasn't considered a drug. We, do, we don't consider someone who's using Dilaudid on prescription to treat pain a drug user, but we would consider someone who's homeless using the same substance in the same quantities a drug user. The fact that we might increasingly consider a substance like Dilaudid a drug rather than a medicine is precisely because of the fact that it's used by people who are homeless off prescription. That is, that it's been diverted to illegal drug markets. So it's to the legal status of psychoactive substances or the perceived character of the people who use them that we most commonly refer when we talk about drugs. Correspondingly, to study people who um, are using drugs is to explore 
how they um, interpret and experience the management of being identified as a group of people using a morally and legally sanctioned group of substances. <coughs> Likewise, we can view addiction as a medical fact, a disease with a distinct etiology and symptomology. And from this view, addiction is a condition that pre-exists its discovery by medical science. However, this is to ignore how closely linked both popular and clinical understandings of addiction are to cultural notions of desirable and undesirable forms of behavior. Consider the normative or judgmental, um, the normative or judgmental nature of terms like abuse, misuse, or problematic substance <coughs> use. These terms clearly imply that users are exceeding somehow standards of normal behavior and or their ethical responsibilities to themselves and others. This poses a particular problem for mothers and pregnant women. Becoming a mother in contemporary Euro-American societies and cultures comes with a powerful set of normative expectations that, that appear to have intensified over the last 50 years. Pregnancy is now regarded an at-risk state that requires constant intervention, surveillance, and monitoring on the part of health professionals and the pregnant woman herself. Childhood, similarly, appears to be rife with risks to a child's safety, his emotional well-being, his long-term health, and even his neurobiological development that only the devoted mother can protect against. These insights help to explain why so many, so many women voluntarily seek out information and support to address their drug use during pregnancy. They also explain why so many women cite concern for their children as their primary reason for doing so. But they also help to explain why pregnant women and mothers who continue to use drugs are so often labeled selfish, uncaring, irresponsible, and neglectful of their children's needs regardless of their actual mothering practices. This is particularly so in the case of women from disadvantaged backgrounds. Whereas drinking alcohol or using other drugs during <coughs> pregnancy and parenthood cuts across all social divisions, it's the, the societal disapproval and stigmatization of women for doing these things is disproportionately attached to poor and racialized women. Again, it's only certain drugs associated with certain drug users that is com compatible Incom that is considered incompatible with motherhood. And we can think of a recent discussion around um, psychotropic drug use, the use of antidepressants during pregnancy as an example. Finally, it's important to recognize that the services and supports that are available to this population are extremely limited. Even though women's drug use became the object of public health research starting in the 1980s and has since become a kind of explosive topic or area of study in, in clinical and epidemiological research, evidence suggests that the supports offered in existing services and programs designed to meet the needs of this group are still extremely limited. For example, over the last 30 years, a number of hospital-based specialized maternity clinics have been established in major cities across Australia, New Zealand, North America, the UK and Europe. These services are designed to provide integrated care to chemically dependent pregnant women. And they're often held up as examples of less punitive, more harm reduction focused approaches to this group. This is largely because pregnant women are given priority access to substitution treatments through these services. Things like methadone, buprenorphine and other drug treatment regimes. However, women who are unwilling or unable to become stable through the course of their pregnancies, who are homeless or who continue to use um, street drugs, for example, experience high degrees of surveillance and monitoring in these services and forms of coercion that can sometimes prevent them from attending or can make disclosing a need for more support um, something that they're unwilling to do. In short, because women's caregiving responsibilities are often called upon to justify the allocation of resources for this group, 
The structure and organization of drug treatment supports for pregnant women and mothers are often guided by a commitment to fetal and child health rather than maternal well-being. Certainly it's the case that while abstinence may no longer be a requirement of maintaining custody of children in many countries in the world, adhering to drug treatment regimes now is. Moreover, existing drug treatment services and programs, like many health services, are hampered by limited funding and by an individualistic approach to um, changing health behavior, which severely limits what they can and do accomplish in terms of improving drug-using women's um, health and well-being. So the women I interviewed for this study were not impervious to any of these normative and um, legal constraints. Not only was I unable to recruit many research participants who identified as actively using, in virtually all cases the women that I spoke to explained why and how they were trying to stop, reduce, or modify their injecting drug use. And I don't think that that fact was unrelated to all of the details that I've just outlined. So the focus of my research therefore became on how women interpreted and experienced this moment in their lives, um, disengaging from injecting drug use and becoming a mother. So for this, I drew on a sociological approach to recovery. And I put recovery in quotation marks because I think it is a bit of a misnomer for the complexity and, and back and forth nature of this process. That's why I've opted to use the word disengagement instead. So from a sociological perspective, recovery is fundamentally dependent on a drug user or addict's social and personal identity undergoing change. It requires engaging in new relationships, new practices, um, new configurations of one's life. It's a less of a pharmacological process and more of a social one. From this perspective, motherhood can be seen as a, as a major motivating and facilitating role in achieving a normative social identity. In fact, some scholars go so far as to say that being a mother is the most likely event that will empower a woman who uses drugs to abstain. This um, approach to recovery on the part of drug using women while recognizing the social dimensions of the experience I think overstates the simplicity of this process and doesn't actually acknowledge the complexity of identity transition. For example, Pregnant women and mothers, even those who are in drug treatment, are highly likely to experience ongoing stigmatization and social exclusion. Many women, on, um, many women who have children who are on methadone maintenance treatment programs, for example, don't enjoy that experience because they perceive themselves, um, they perceive that others perceive them as kind of highly stigmatized methadone mothers which acts as a kind of barrier to the identity transition that they're hoping to make. Becoming a mother and engaging in drug treatment on their own, in other words, can hardly be said to repair one's social identity. Further complicating matters is the fact that, as Karen Hughes argues, to cease engaging in drug using, living and identity practices is, in a sense, to cease to be oneself. She describes how active drug use brings into being a particular sense of self through one's engagement in routine living and identity practices, such as using, scoring, coming up with money for drugs, etc. This is why, Hughes argues, recovery is such a complex process that often involves what she calls the inevitable pull of one's former sense of self. This research and other studies um, have more recently drawn attention to the fact that recovery invariably involves the loss of a familiar way of life and its pleasures that aren't easily forgotten or replaced. It also suggests that recovery can be a dynamic, circuitous process due to the plural, fragmentary, and sometimes contradictory nature of identity. Another important consideration is the fact that drug use is a powerful embodied experience, which a growing number of sociological studies have explored. Given Western cultural views of the self as a property of the mind, 
which, uh, um, which many drug, or drug users draw attention to when they talk about their experiences of getting out of it, for example, means that the experience of using drugs, particularly intense experiences of using drugs like injecting and injecting drugs like heroin, can manifest as a powerful experience of becoming body. Others have considered how the embodied experience of drug use can be examined from a phenomenological perspective in terms of a drug user's sense of being in the world. So from this perspective, women drug users with children can have two competing embodied experiences of being in the world, existing with and for others, and existing exclusively for the sake of the embodied self. Taken together, sociological approaches to recovery draw our attention to the ways in which people come to know and experience themselves through their engagements in habits, rituals, and embodied practices, and also through their interactions with others. They raise a number of questions, therefore, about women's experiences of drug treatment, disengagement, and motherhood that haven't been very extensively explored in most treatment-focused studies. Exploring disengagement in the lives of women with children from a sociological perspective as a complex experience of living with and negotiating conflicting ways of being oneself might help to inform these existing approaches and could possibly also inspire others. So now I'll just move on to give you a few details about the study that the preceding findings are based on. So the study I um, undertook involved semi-structured, in-depth interviews with 21 young women who were pregnant and or mothers and had a significant history of injecting drug use, as well as a large, which was undertaken within the context of a larger ethnographic research project on young injecting drug users. The majority of participants were recruited through a specialist maternity clinic for women with substance use issues at the Royal Women's Hospital in Melbourne, Australia. Interviews were one-off, lasted between one and three hours, and were designed to elicit an, in an induced and accompanied self-analysis on the part of participants. The young women that I spoke to were between 18 and 27 years old, and all but three had injected drugs within the last 12 months. Seven were pregnant with their first baby, six were pregnant with their second, and three were new mothers of young babies aged six months or younger. The remaining five women each had a child aged six months to two years. Eighteen of the research participants, so the vast majority, described themselves as attempting to disengage from injecting drug use at the time of our interview, although they were very, at very different stages of this process. It's to the accounts of these women that the remainder of this discussion will focus. And uh, particularly, I will look at the accounts of pregnant women <coughs> who were either pregnant or mothers of a first baby, aged six months or younger, many of whom had made their first sustain, real sustained attempt to engage in drug treatment. And then I'll turn to discussing the accounts of mothers of children who were slightly older, six months or older, who had either successfully disengaged from injecting drug use or relapsed. Okay. <clears throat> Might just have a drink of water. which everyone can watch me do. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so um, through this section of the talk, I'm actually going to be putting up, um, hopefully, uh, I'll be putting up um, quotes from interviews that I'm hoping that you'll be able to read while I'm speaking, and it won't be too distracting to be do doing both things at the same time. If, if I am going too quickly or... Um, or if I need to kind of uh, reconfigure that plan, let me know. Don't be shy. So from early on in the study, several things became clear. First, all of the women who were in the process of disengaging from injecting drug use said that they were powerfully motivated by care and concern for their children. This was a particular focus in the interviews that I undertook with pregnant women and mothers of young babies. As a number of other studies have found, Worry about the effects of drugs during pregnancy, as well as losing custody of their children, prompted many women in the study to stop or reduce their illicit drug use and approach drug treatment services. <clears throat> uh, 
One of the most striking themes to emerge in my interviews with pregnant women and new mothers was the detailed way in which they spoke about having a moral and ethical responsibility to care for and protect their children, a duty they said would be impossible to fulfill while they maintained a serious drug habit. Some women talked about this conflict in practical terms, emphasizing their baby's physical dependence on others for care. For example, Lily, a new mother of a two-month-old baby girl, explained her reasons for trying to stop using drugs in the following way. She made reference to the fact that she was a single mother and her daughter would have no one if she went back to using what she called full-on. Several women also talked about this conflict in emotional and relational terms. They imagined that if they continued to inject drugs, they'd be unable to be there for their babies or provide them with the kind of life that they deserved. The focus of these discussions was rarely on basic necessities, on clothing, housing, or feeding their children, but rather making sure that their children, as future people, would be happy, experience stability, and feel loved. In some cases, women's own difficult histories or childhood seem to inform these, um, this concern. Ange, for example, described her son as a new person in the world for whom she hoped to provide a good life compared to the crap life that she had had. Is that working? Are you able to read? Okay. <clears throat> Many women said that it was assuming this responsibility for the life of another person that was the primary incentive that they needed to affect change in their own lives. Jasmine explained her reasons for deciding to continue with an unplanned pregnancy, for example, with reference to the idea that it would help her turn her life around. Alongside determination to do what was best for their babies, another important theme emerged in all women's accounts of disengagement, but particularly those in the latter stages, that is, those who had a baby aged six months or older. Many of these women had not injected drugs for a significant period of time, but they nonetheless felt as though they didn't really belong in the normal world. For some, this was clearly due to ongoing stigmatization. 24 years old and six months pregnant with her second child, Leanne tried to give up heroin in her first pregnancy. And it's not clear why she lost custody of her son, but she described having her second baby with a new partner the only person outside of her drug using networks that she'd become close to as her last chance to get back what she had lost. <clears throat> Leanne saw her current circumstances as extremely precarious. This was despite the fact that she was avoiding her former drug using associates, as she called them, and was engaging in new activities and relationships. And this seemed to be due in no small part to the very fact of being stigmatized. Leanne was stabilized on methadone maintenance treatment, which she felt reproduced some of the same patterns of dependence that she'd experienced when she was a heroin user. It also increased her frustration at being able to live a normal lifestyle. She felt that because of this, she was still fundamentally a junkie in the eyes of others. Nowhere was this more apparent than in her, in her recent dealings with the Department of Human Services, which is the state agency in Victoria, Australia, <coughs> responsible for child protection. She, very, in a very detailed way, described the way in which um, the image of herself that was mirrored back to her by Department of Human uh, Services staff and professionals was as someone who could not be trusted and was not going to be able to cope. Becoming a mother and disengaging from injecting drug use also seemed to leave many women feeling socially isolated. With the exception of two who mentioned reconnecting with a close friend from their pre-drug using days, most women's only significant adult relationships were with a partner or with a family member. Several felt somewhat cut off, cut off from the outside world as a result. <clears throat> Sarah, for example, contrasted her current domesticated existence with her old life when she went from one social thing to the next. She went on to describe having been stuck at home for a year since her son was born, 
not doing anything. This was exacerbated by the fact that she felt little connection to the older, middle-class mothers she'd met at a local mother's group. In turn, Sarah also struggled to do without those aspects of her life that she denied herself in order to be a good mother and a good partner. <coughs> this became clear when she scribed, described losing touch with some of her old, so-called, drug-using friends. At the end of her interview, Sarah summarized that even though giving up drugs had changed her life for the better, she had yet to find herself in the process of making the transition between being a drug addict and being a mum. This account <coughs> illustrated another important theme that emerged in interviews, which was women's ambivalence. Invariably, at some point, women in the process of disengagement would mention aspects of their old lives that were difficult to give up, replace, or live without. Most hesitated noticeably before going into much detail here, but some did refer to things like the intensely pleasurable effects of injecting drugs, particularly heroin, which they also said were impossible to describe in words and could only be understood by someone who had been there. However, a number of women sort of tried to describe this for me. As one young mother, Tamara, explained, the feeling heroin gives you always stays in your mind, even if you never touch it again. Another young woman, Esther, a mother of a seven-month-old girl, who had relapsed shortly before our interview, explained how good it felt to have a taste again. She admitted that she'd been thinking about it constantly ever since, and she said the very idea made her feel high extremely. Am I going too fast? Some women said that the pleasures of injecting itself were the most difficult to give up or forget. Kay Lee, a 25-year-old pregnant woman and mother who, of a six-year-old girl, had recently begun to dabble with heroin again. She explained she could go without drugs themselves, but not the feeling and intensity of using a needle. She described the particular appeal of injecting as the way that she'd always used drugs, and she described it as seeing the needle go into your skin and pulling it, or they say, jacking it back, watching the blood, and then knowing that you're pushing it in. She summarized this with the phrase, the feel of the steel. This account was corroborated by other women in the study who described sensations like tingling or aching in the places in their bodies where they used to inject drugs even at the thought of doing so again. And for some, this was accompanied by physical sensations like pleasure or excitement. Some of the new mothers I interviewed had only just recently stopped injecting drugs and were struggling to imagine life without the activities and routines that had previously sustained them. Lily, for example, disclosed that she was worried about having some of the same thoughts as she used to. As our interview progressed, it became clear that Lily didn't miss any drug in particular, but addiction as an all-consuming way of life. So before moving on to the discussion, I'd like to, you know, I'd like to um, draw your attention to the fact that certainly not all women in this study um, talked about having ambivalent feelings about disengaging from injecting drug use. Several, in fact, expressed only disgust and contempt for their former lives. These women fell into two general categories, those who had only recently stopped using and those who had, had not been used, injected drugs for a significant length of time but were still stigmatized and treated like junkies. Women in the former group, like Jackie, were more likely to talk about disengagement in black and white terms and to judge other drug-using mothers. Women in the latter group, who felt that they were heavily stigmatized, were more likely to renounce all aspects of their former lives, the drugs, their partners, their friends, even themselves. It was also notable that women who had relapsed did not necessarily condemn themselves or their actions and seemed to find ways to normalize <coughs> their drug use, providing that they felt that their children were adequate, adequately cared for. For example, Kaylee described herself as a drug user, not an addict. She explained the key difference was her ability to keep her drug use to herself 
so that it didn't have an impact on her daughter. When I asked Kaylee what had had a bigger impact on her life, using drugs or being a mother, she said that the path that she was taking through life was not straight, but it was of her own choosing. So the findings of this study clearly demonstrate or support the idea that disengaging from injecting drug use is made possible by disengaging from one's former drug using networks and engaging in new activities and, relations, and relationships or relational configurations, such as the work of caring for children. Many women in this study clearly saw becoming a mother as a turning point that opened up the possibility for them to reinvent themselves and to turn their lives around. That said, it was also clear that being a mother and avoiding one's former drug using networks were not on their own enough for these women to reinvent themselves. Some felt deeply discredited by their former lives as addicts or junkies. And for these women, the ability to adopt a non-addict identity to see themselves as worthy and capable of being mothers required others' recognition, which was not always forthcoming. Leanne, for example, appeared to experience what criminal justice theorist John Braithwaite would call stigmatizing shaming. That is, the communication of disapproval in ways that are disrespectful and block access to acceptable social roles. Even though most women felt that becoming a mother had changed their lives for the better, many also felt someone, somewhat let down by this process. All of these women had cut off contact with old drug using friends, but few had any means to form non-drug using relationships. They appeared, in other words, to have few bridging ties to people outside of their former drug using networks. Those who did venture into the non-drug using world felt that they needed to conceal their past in order to avoid being stigmatized. Most women were also single, stay-at-home mothers who did not have the qualifications or the resources that they needed to seek out meaningful work or education. So the day-to-day -day work of caring for a child paradoxically allowed for some aspects of the normal life that they hoped to find, but prevented them from cultivating others namely working, studying, finding a partner, and making new friends. This seemingly common experience of loneliness or social isolation has received relatively little attention in the treatment literature. Many women also felt keenly the loss of their former drug using networks and their sense of which had changed their sense of belonging in the world. Sarah, for example, had successfully disengaged from injecting drug use, in part by virtue of her attachment to her child and her new partner, and her sense of responsibility as a mother. But disengaging from injecting, injecting drug use had left a void in her life, in terms of the pleasures of going from one social thing to the next. Other women said that they'd never forget the feelings that drugs gave them, and missed the thrill and intensity of using. Some felt lost with the, without the everyday rhythms and routines of maintaining a drug habit, which, as Lily suggested, can give structure and meaning to one's life. Each of these findings seems to reinforce Hughes's argument that drug-taking practices and relationships are in and of themselves constitutive of particular identities and ways of being oneself that people carry with them, even in the process of making a transition to a non-drug-using identity. An interesting theme to emerge in these accounts was the particular significance of injecting as a sensorial embodied experience. Several women claimed to crave the intensity of the feel of the steel. Some would suggest that this is clearly the expression of operant conditioning. That is, when the pleasurable effects of the drug become associated with injecting, and that therefore this act becomes the desired psychopharmacological fix. However, if we accept a view that injecting involves crossing bodily boundaries and symbolic boundaries, boundaries between one way of being in the world in relation to the other and another way of being in the world in relation to one's physicality, 
It's possible that the feel of the steel also engages the injector in embodied living and identity practices in familiar ways of being and experiencing herself. More research is needed to explore whether this is a common experience or not, but it's possible that injecting as a uniquely embodied practice, practice of the self might be particularly difficult to forget. Interestingly, very few women were comfortable discussing or exploring their ambivalence, the pull of their previous drug-using living and identity practices. Much, they were much more likely to engage in what appeared to be negative contexting, that is, frequently reminding themselves of how awful life on drugs had been, what a bad person they were when they were a drug user, etc. Many women also reaffirmed that they could not, would not, ever allow themselves to become the archetypal junkie mum. This in particular appeared to motivate several women at the earlier stages of disengagement, um, but at the same time, renouncing the junkie limited women's ability to discuss the pleasures or sense of being in the world that their former drug-using living and identity practices had provided. This in turn seemed to make it difficult for them to integrate their past and their previous their past and previous selves with who they were now and who they were going to become. So in this study, exploring mother's accounts of disengaging from injecting drug use revealed that the transformation of personal identity is complex indeed. The women interviewed uh, struggled to disentangle themselves from their previous addict, addict identities and it, this was a struggle that was complicated by their ongoing stigmatization and because of their limited ability to lead normal lives. For many, disengaging from injecting drug use also meant disengaging from practices and relationships that were once integral to who they were. Some were ambivalent about this process despite their care and their concern for their children. They felt that who they were had somehow been lost in the process of migrating between being an addict and being a mother. These findings could help to explain things like the relatively high rates of postpartum relapse among this group. If women who attempt to stop or reduce their drug use in pregnancy are also engaged in an attempt to restore their discredited social identities, their success or failure will depend on more than whether they have access to effective drug treatment, however. It will also depend on whether they have the non-judgmental support of others and the recognition that they are, they are effectively making a transition into a new identity. Specialized drug treatment services for pregnant women and mothers could potentially provide some of these supports by helping women to establish bridging ties to non-drug using networks and relationships and by making an active effort to avoid stigmatizing women. And yet, even with these kinds of supports, some mother's sense of self and belonging will remain deeply entangled with drug using, living and identity practices. Indeed, feeling the embodied pull of these practices is, it seems to be an, up, an unavoidable part of recovery, even for women with children. This group, however, is likely to perceive their ambivalent feelings as particularly threatening. They're much less likely to explore or discuss them with others as a result for they have a great deal at stake in making a quote-unquote successful recovery. It seems all the more important, therefore, to help them find ways to accept and come to terms with ambivalence and not just overcome it. Doing so might also help to mitigate women's fears of being judged by health and welfare professionals, which has been found consistently to be a significant barrier to care. <coughs> Likewise, perhaps we also need to develop a broader continuum of services and programs that would benefit women who use drugs and their children. As others have argued, not all women view their addictions in ways that correspond with drug treatment modalities or ideologies. They don't always see their addictions as fundamentally, morally or physically damaging. Indeed, several women in this study were neither ready nor willing to stop using entirely even though they very much wanted what was best for their children. Rather than direct energy and resources toward achieving abstinence or preventing relapse, services and programs might be more likely to engage and support 
such women if they focused on helping them address the points of tension between their drug use and their parenting. Research on the various formal and informal strategies that women who are active drug users use to prevent harm coming to their children could provide a very helpful starting point for these initiatives. Finally, there is widespread recognition that we need to improve women's access to and experiences of drug treatment, but perhaps it's also to take more seriously how broader social contexts, the moral and legal regulations surrounding drug use, for example, or the fact that those who suffer the most damaging effects of drug use come from impoverished and disadvantaged backgrounds needs to be made central to the project of rethinking drug treatment. Thank you. That's a good question. Yes and no. I, I think it depends on where in Canada you're talking about, because I think actually one of the um, Canada and Australia, in terms of you know best practices um, in, in drug treatment settings, are very similar. Um, but the largest divides in that, uh, bearing that in mind, then the largest divides would be, for example, between sort of resource poor and resource rich areas. So if I undertook this study in, say, Toronto or Vancouver, I'm not sure that things would have looked that different, except, be, you know, except the fact that there are sort of different forms of social exclusion and stuff that play out in those cities that are different to uh, Melbourne. But I think the real difference um, will be what I see carrying out this kind of research in Nova Scotia, where um, you know, there just seems to be um, a real lack of support for or resources for a kind of systematic establishment of drug treatment for this group. And I imagine that likewise if I'd done the research in a rural area of Australia, it would have con uh, confronted different circumstances. <coughs> mm -hmm. um, <coughs> just wondering if you've done any research or you know of any research, um, Sort of just thinking of sort of what's going on in the states where women are being you know, jailed and prosecuted for behaviors during pregnancy. So if you see this sort of focus on the fetus um, or, and the, the stigmatization and, and surveillance of pregnant women, do you see that leading to criminalization or pre apprehensions or anything? Along in Canada? Way? In Canada. Well, as you most of you know a fetus has no legal right of personhood in Canada nor in Australia. So um, that's the reason why apprehensions don't happen when women are pregnant. Um, I can only sort of speak to how service providers would sort of get around that sometimes in Australia, which was, for example, if a woman had an older child, they could um, make a child protection notification on behalf of that older child. They would actually um, talk about it in that term, in those terms, like how to, um, how to kind of work with the um, constraints that they were facing in terms of when and how they could make a child protection notification. So I don't see in Canada, unless that law changes, that women are going to be apprehended for using drugs in pregnancy. Um, they can't be legally, yeah. um, but they are if they have older children quite often. Exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. have babies being apprehended at the hospital. Yeah. Which, you know. Um, yeah, right away after yeah, birth. Right away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. So maybe I'll build on that comment in thinking about what are some of the structural or programmatic conditions that we generate uh, some of these findings like ambivalence. So um, there was that interesting comment uh, around the engagement uh, that the, the person had uh, with the authorities of, are you okay, or are you gonna relapse, right? And so I wondered what other kind of pressure points do you have inside of 
uh, the system through which women uh, are required to seek care uh, mm -hmm. that might lead to what we would call performance. Mm -hmm. You know, that you need to act a role, you have to have this confessional quality of, you know, denouncing your former self and seeking to rebirth, which of course has strong religious connotations, mm -hmm. uh, which are deeply embedded, we know, in a lot of drug treatment programs kind of stem that line. Mm -hmm. So I wondered if you saw systematic qualities um, that generate this kind of responses. I did, for sure. Um, that's sort of... Um, it, there's an anthropologist, Summer Sinkar, who talks about the script that women have to use to mobilize resources, to also navigate the system. And that script is very much one, they, they learn very quickly what they're expected to say and think and feel about their experiences. And uh, increasingly, um, you know, this includes a kind of uh, <coughs> rationalization of one's drug use in response to a logic of having been traumatized or sexually abused. Um, and, and so this script is something I think women learn, um, and I, but I don't think it's always the case that they're able, there's this kind of distance between the self that's presented and a sort of social and personal identity. Um, many women come to kind of see and understand their own experiences through those scripts, right? Which are both helpful in some senses and I think kind of damaging and limiting in others. For example, if your drug use was just a kind of flawed strategy to deal with psychic pain, then that means that you've sort of got to kind of cut out, off or cut out this entire part of your life because it was, it was a misguided strategy, it was a flawed attempt, rather than acknowledge the things that that might have brought you at a particular point in time. Um, so there is a very clear and very, very dominant and quite homogenous script, I think, that people, women learn that they have to adopt and they have to speak um, when engaging with services, especially if they've had a kind of long history of involvement with health and welfare system, whether they, they were themselves wards of the state, for example, as children. Um, <coughs> and uh, there's an interesting tension for me in doing this research because a lot of sociological uh, studies in this field now adopt this kind of narrative analysis to drug users' accounts. They look at the scripts that researchers are given as, as um, you know, they imagine that researchers are sort of perceived as a kind of extension of health and welfare services, that drug users are performing a kind of um, social self for researchers as well as for health, health and welfare providers. And while I do think that this, that did shape what women had to tell me, in, for some reason, I feel like at certain, mo at certain mom moments or points, they were actually quite honest with me about their experiences, these moments when feelings of ambivalence would kind of bubble up, and there would be very like spontaneous and unique and creative ways of describing what it was that they missed or what it was that they were struggling to do without. So I didn't want to kind of shut that down by drawing on a, a narrative approach entirely. But I could talk more to your question after, maybe. Yes? Um, a lot of what you're talking about made me think of many women's experiences in becoming mothers. Just yeah. anecdotally, you know, whatever your identity was before, often gets changed and a lot of that has to do with societal conceptions of motherhood and that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. how useful do you think it is to sort of control for those common features versus take advantage of it in designing treatment plans? So to say, okay, all women go through this identity transformation, so mm -hmm. we won't incorporate that into the treatment plan, or should that be utilized? Um, they do use it. Um, there's a sort of, um, there's a kind of language that's actually often used in treatment focus studies, which is about sort of, uh, it's a kind of really objectionable language, I find, about how to leverage, for example, women's concerns for their children um, to better engage them in services, how to take advantage of the window of opportunity that pregnancy presents. It's um, very much described in those terms. But after that point, there isn't very much attention given to what it actually means to become a mother or what it actually means to be pregnant on an experiential level. Um, 
the kinds of um, complicated and mixed feelings that you might have in you know, suddenly having another person who you're responsible for and doing that with very few supports. There isn't actually a lot of space, I don't think, dedicated to exploring those experiences in treatment settings. It's more like pregnancy and motherhood are acknowledged as good moments to engage women in treatment, but after that point, generally speaking, there isn't that much exploration of what those experiences are actually like. Just like there isn't in mainstream obstetric care, you know, you kind of go in, you get checked, you've got like maybe 10 minutes <laughs> with your physician, and then you're out again, right? Yes, uh-oh, <laughs> that sparked so. <laughs> Yes. Um, thanks so much for that. I was sitting here thinking about a story, and I'll get around to a question, but a little story. I um, for a, spent a period of time at Dalhousie Legal Aid Service, and mm -hmm. I had a client there who described um, she had gone in, into a shopping mall and left her eight-year-old son with her then boyfriend in the car and came back to the car <coughs> and the guy was showing her son how to inject mm. um, and it was just such a shocking dramatic um, incident to, to me that it, uh, it, it burns in my mind and um, as you were talking I was thinking both about the role of children and family services in mm -hmm. the background through all of this discussion um, and I think that the systems in Australia and in Nova Scotia anyway are not too different in terms of the types of intervention and when they happen, unlike in New Zealand. But anyway. And the risk, and the risk indicators that are used. Yes. Yeah. Um, but what I was thinking about, about this and the reason I told that story was the role of one's partner in all of this. Mm -hmm. And I noticed you did, you mentioned in at least one um, that the woman had kind of gone on to a new crowd or a new new partner or mm -hmm. new associations. I wondered if you explicitly looked at that aspect of it uh, and in particular about whether one's partner is um, mm -hmm. an ID user or not and how strong that influence would be in these circumstances. Yes, um, I did look at that. I didn't include it here, but I did. Um, so. Um, one of the things that women did in addition to engaging in drug treatment is almost all of the women that I spoke to whose partners or the father of their babies were still using, if they were still around, but they were still using, they left those partners. Um, and um, some women had partners who kind of embarked on the journey with them. They engaged in drug treatment also, but this was more unusual. Either women were single mothers or they became single mothers because they left a drug using partner. Um, and what was interesting about this was that, um, I mean, not only were women sometimes conflicted about cutting someone out of their life who they, they loved and who was a, an important part of their life, but they also, it also meant that it was another barrier to the kind of normal family that they wanted to build. That, that in order to to um, do what was best for their children, to become normal mothers, it also meant becoming single mothers. So um, there weren't too many cases, perhaps, because of the particular moment in which I was talking to women, which was, you know, at the sort of um, a period of time in which they were under intense scrutiny, but also going through a kind of uh, fairly substantial change. There weren't too many women who, there weren't any women who had partners in their lives who were still injecting drug users. Yeah. Hi. Um, my question is, how do you see the law, or even do you see the law as a helpful or therapeutic agent in overcoming any of the challenges you mentioned today? <laughs> um, that is a great question. I, I wish I knew. Um, I'd actually be very happy to hear from members of the audience what they think. I'm sure you would do a much better job of answering that question <laughs> than I would. Um, you know, other than child protection, um, mandatory reporting requirements, you know, those 
those are the sort of most, um, those are the kind of, I guess, legal regulations that have the most direct impact on this population. But, uh, you know, ending prohibition might be a good thing. Um, you know, there's a kind of misconception that I was trying to kind of draw attention to in the introduction, and I'm not sure if I did it all that well, that the harms caused by drugs um, are, you know, it's a result of their pharmacological properties, and that's often a justification, usually a huge justification for um, making substances illegal, right? Um, I noticed, you know, that, for example, methamphetamine has been moved from a Schedule three drug to a Schedule one drug. It was moved, I think, in 2010 <coughs> in the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act. And there's no question that the broader context of a kind of moral panic around crystal meth informed that, that move. Um, but the result and the out outcome is almost always making the lives of people who use that substance a lot more chaotic, a lot more difficult, a lot more dangerous, um, making it likely that they will be arrest, arrested, charged, and imprisoned for using the drug. So um, the laws around substances and, you know, there's, there has been quite a lot of research done on this, but, you know, I think you could quite easily argue are doing a lot more harm than they're doing good. So that would be another very general armchair pie in the sky answer to your question. Mm -hmm. Yes? I was wondering if there's any programs out there currently existing that you felt were doing a good job or could maybe act as models for um, providing those social supports that these women were expressing as unfulfilled? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know the full range of programs and services that are being offered to this group. I do know that um, you know, some of the most progressive community-based um, programs and services in Canada um, are still very much hampered by uh, limited resources, by um, the kinds of constraints that they have to meet to get ongoing funding, how they have to kind of describe the work that they're doing and the potential outcomes that they're going to be able to achieve through that work, which, which does mean that the supports offered in even the best, most community-based programs are going to be very individualizing and individualistic, sort of focusing on improving health behaviors, um, you know, encouraging women to make better choices. Um, certainly, you know, we don't require women to be completely abstinent when they're pregnant or, or mothers to maintain custody of their children, but we do require them in a pretty coercive and invasive way to adhere to treatment regimes which don't always work for everyone. And so um, to answer your question, I think a more genuinely harm reduction approach to this population would be helpful. So focusing, for example, on not just minimizing the harms associated with using substances, but mini minimizing the harms associated with using substances while you're responsible for caring for children. So being able to have open conversations with women about um, if they're going to use, is there someone around who can look after their kid? Um, you know, what's the situation like in their house? How are they doing for money? Um, you know, I mean, harm reduction has been implemented also in very individualizing and individualistic ways, but we haven't even gotten to the point that mainstream populations have gotten to for pregnant women and mothers because there's this absolute kind of barrier stop stopping point, which is their responsibilities for their children. Yeah. Sorry, full disclosure, I'm a social worker. Um, <laughs> but I just wanted to add on to that, um, speaking of therapeutic change, not keeping women in poverty. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. um, income assistance, just so you know, you get $535 a month mm -hmm. for rent. Where are you supposed to keep your children living in a positive environment? If that's what you have for rent, you know, 200 and something for personal. How are you supposed to buy your children? So, so we're keeping women in poverty and then we're apprehending them. Mm -hmm. So it, if there needs to be a law change or a policy change, that would be a therapy. Of course, yeah. And that's, again, 
So again, it's like the, the potential chaoticness of women's lives or the harms that they're doing to their children is attributed to the drugs, right? That they're taking these drugs, which mean they have no control over their behavior. Um, whereas if their circumstances were different and they were taking the drugs, then their lives would look a whole lot less chaotic and would be a whole lot less chaotic. So I agree with you. Oh, sorry. Right. Um, and you mentioned briefly in passing sort of that, you know, thinking about what are where drugs can be sort of moralistic. Um, what are the drugs you want to condemn, which are the ones that we, you know, mm -hmm. have that use of like SSRIs by women who are pregnant that are, there's been shifts there in a very different sort of population, but I'm wondering mm -hmm. if there's a way to sort of capitalize yeah. On some of that, I think in, there is in the population that you're working with. But I was wondering if any of any of them had any sort of insight or had noticed sort of some of those shifts. And yeah, and noticed sort of the discrepancy or the obviously double standard of being applied. Well, yeah, the dis discrepancy is pretty obvious, but I think you're right to use the language. I think you could leverage <laughs> some of those arguments that are made in favor of. Um, keeping women on psychotropic medications during pregnancy. With the arguments made are, are almost always about, you know, the risks of her ceasing to use those drugs are far greater um, than the risk posed to the health of her fetus if she continues to use them, right? And especially with SSRIs, then it's the mental health of um, the woman that's that referred to in that argument, right? That. Um, and you could, I think, if you were a savvy legal person, <laughs> make a case that um, you know the mental health of women who are using illicit drugs is just as likely to be compromised if they're forced into certain situations that aren't going to work for them vis-a-vis -vis drug treatment or abstinence, that you know this actually represents a, a huge risk to their health and well-being. So, I think there is actually some potential there that's been opened up by um, the sort of uh, acknowledgement that substances can and do play a vital role in people's lives and sustaining health and normality that you could capitalize on to make an argument that the same goes for, for other populations. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I was wondering about uh, following a, a little bit about a line of thought here of mm -hmm. uh, how significant it has been to medicalize as a way of seeking positive intervention. Mm -hmm. um, but the worry that in doing that, you move away from the socialized aspect of understanding. Yes. Um, of, of understanding vulnerability and marginalization and so forth. So I wonder, in this context, to speak of disengagement mm -hmm. as in the interest of the child. Mm -hmm. um, and I wondered about breaking that a little bit in the sense of disengagement from drug use not always being uh, in, the best. In, the, in the best interest of the child and how much of an appetite is there for that kind of thinking in um, drug treatment programs. Uh, and as well as the idea of disengagement, you cannot disengage from poverty, which is likely the largest cause of in child endangerment. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I wondered about using that language of engagement, disengagement, suggest again like volitional individual action in mm -hmm. this space, which seems to color the whole way that interventions that uh, follow as Proceed. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I think that medicalizing, so, so say for example, following up on the previous question, if uh, people were able to make an argument that, for example, uh, a mother, a pregnant woman who's using, um, say she's a street user of Dilaudid, for example, um, that getting her off that substance would uh, compromise her mental health, um, wouldn't be good for her, and the risks of that would be greater than the risks that using the substance pose for her baby. If we were able to make that kind of argument, then you would have to make an argument about the way in which that substance actually addresses the mental health of the woman, which would, of course, involve kind of sucking the whole complexity of the experience that's social, that's embodied, that's, um, you know, um, for some people spiritual, into this sort of <coughs> medical argument. I'm using this drug because I'm suffering emotionally. Um, 
and there there will be consequences of the, I mean this is sort of the poli the political terrain that that this field actually is is that there are always consequences that are sometimes unforeseen of making those kinds of arguments and medicalization on one hand while well, opens up avenues for treatment and destigmatization it also sort of circumscribes the ways in which we can kind of understand people's experiences. And I don't think I'm addressing the second part of your question, but I might have to do that later. I'm running out of steam. <laughs> and I think you are too. I, I teach and I can always tell when people are like, it's time to go now. <laughs> it's time. I like you, but I want to go. <laughs> Well, I think we better <laughs> let Fiona sit down for a moment. And, uh, oh, I meant you, not me. But yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> well, before I thank Fiona, I want to make a couple of announcements. One is that um, there's one more public law seminar this year. It's on Friday, March 27. It's Peter Tuig of St. Mary's University speaking on the most suitable worker regulating nursing assistance in Canada, 1945 to 1970. The Health Law Institute is co-sponsoring with the Canadian Centre for Ethics and Public Affairs an event later this month. It's called Vaccination, question uh, mark. And there's a series of topics, but it's summed up in to what extent should vaccines be mandatory, uh, looking both at childhood immunization and also at um, adult healthcare workers vaccination. Uh, and this features Scott Halperin, who's with the Canadian Centre for Vaccinology, Bob Strand, who's the Chief Public Health Officer for Nova Scotia, Janet Hazelton, President of the Nova Scotia Nurses Union, and I'm Elaine Gibson, and I'm here with the Health Law Institute. <laughs> Uh, and so that's down at the Public Library, March 23rd from 7 to 8.30 p.m. And I've printed off some posters. I'll just leave a couple of piles of them in case you want to take the information. Because it's not on our regular poster schedule. It's a separate event. Now, <coughs> I can't imagine how hard it would be to get research ethics approval for a project of this sort in Nova Scotia. I don't know about it. Um, so it seems to me both the problems with how you go about this and um, what Fiona was mentioning at the start about how hard it was to actually get access to this population um, means that Fiona has done a lot of hard work and provided us with a very important window into a world that we don't often have access to. Um, so the work is extremely valuable and I hope that we'll have a lot more of it in the Nova Scotia and Atlantic and Canadian context. And um, it's of particular interest to me in that it's, so we have a fair amount of work on injection drug use generally, but once you layer on the pregnancy and the motherhood, um, then you're also involving another life or potential life or life in this population and the analysis gets all the more complex as a result. Uh, and I think you've gained an appreciation of that today. I sure have and I really would ask you to join me in thanking Fiona for this wonderful presentation.